เดี๋ยวสักครู่นะครับมันเป็นลิงก์เดิมใช่ไหมโอเคเอ่อ so good morning everyone I yeah my apologies that I cannot be there today so today I'm gonna have a lecture uh for one hour and I need to leave early so um the first part will be lecture live uh via Zoom here and then the rest of the content I'll send to a recorded lecture later on today okay and um there will be a lab exercise about Version controls and code review. So in the live lecture today, I'm gonna give the lecture about version control and code review first, and then the implementation and the code comment will be uh, in the recorded video. Okay. Ah, uh, so maybe I I'll wait for a few more minutes before your friends, uh, come in. Okay. So we'll start sometime around ten thirty five. Okay. Ah, uh, so let's let's wait a bit. I'll be back. Okay, ah, it's about time. So let's get started. 
So today I'm going to discuss a few topics that involve software implementation. And for this concept of implementation in software engineering, it's not about teaching you how to write programs. Like I'm not going to tell you how to write uh, if statement, for loop, while loop, that kind of thing. But we're going to discuss several concepts that surround um, implementation and helps the implementation to be better with higher quality code and uh, easily to maintain, okay? So many of the references that I use today is from this book. It is called Software Engineering at Google Book. It is a free book and it is a pretty useful and interesting book. I would encourage you to read it. It is the book that are, that is a collection of best practices that Google company has been using for managing their software projects. So it is very um, valuable and can be used as a reference for many companies, especially uh, the one in Thailand that we don't have much of the good best practices in software engineering, okay? Ah. So uh, I'll talk about a few things, but today in the live lecture, I'm gonna talk about version control and code review first. And then these two will be in the recorded video that I will send to you later on, okay? Yeah. So if you have the PDF, we need to skip to these two parts first. So let's go to the code review first. Okay, so first code review is a process an activity is this an activity in software development that you have another team members or even more than one more uh, like have team members to review your code changes okay so it is an activity So we have the activity that the team members review other members' code. And the code can be new code that just uh, being written, or it can be code changes that has been written before, but somebody make a new changes to the code and then it needs to be reviewed, okay? So the usual process is that you have this author of the code, whether it's a new code or it's a code change, and then you have multiple people who act as uh, reviewers and that task is getting the code from the reviewers they check it and then they give the feedback so the feedback mostly are constructive ones um, they are the one that decide whether this is a good code or not and what are the improvements that can be done also maybe suggest some other types of implementation that can be adopted, so on and so on. So this loop keeps going until the reviewers are happy and then the change will be merged into the code base, okay? There is a study to ask the developer on what are the practice that they think is uh, the one that helps improve the quality of the code the most, okay? So common practice for writing clean and good quality code, code review is ranked as number one. Now, so 27% of the developers in this study believe that doing code review is a good way to have clean and good quality code. The second one is unit tests. Uh, third one is functional tests. We're gonna talk about testing in, in the next lecture. And CI, other type of testing, requirements, so on and so on, okay? but. Here, we focus on the code review. Okay, so code review is ranked as number one to give high quality code. So let me explain you a bit about the history of code review. Code review has been around for a long time. It started since 1976. That is almost 50 years ago. Okay, the people or uh, the person who proposed this concept is called Michael Fagan. And he is a software engineer at IBM, a big company that produced both hardware and software. So at the time, 50 years ago, uh, we just recently, we, was, uh, we, we just had a computer and the computer was not so powerful at the time. 
So the software that you wrote on those machines also are not very complex, but there are some certain level of software uh, that they, you have to develop. So at IBM, they also developed some software. And Michael Fagan thinks that to have the better software quality and also to increase the productivity of the programmer, we should do some activity that helps improve this quality. So he proposed the idea of code inspection and it later become effective and widely used at the company. And later it was adopted by other companies and now become one of the, the main activities in software engineering. Code inspection at the time can be done on multiple items. It can be done on code. It can be done on design artifacts. It can be done on requirements, on user information, on documentation, and also on the tests. Okay, so it is pretty uh, general and it can be applied to multiple types of artifacts in software development. Michael Fagan has done a study comparing when you use inspection and you do not use inspection. So this is a graph in X axis. It shows the phases in software development lifecycle starting from planning, requirements, design, code, test, and then deployment or ship. So the time starts from the left to the right, okay? The time of the project. And the y-axis is the people resources, or we can just call it as a cost that you need to pay for developing a software project. There are two lines here. The one dotted line are the costs that you need to use when you do inspection. And the one with the solid line is the cost that you have to use when you do without inspection. So when we compare them, we will see that at the beginning, when you do inspection, you pay a little bit higher cost there compared to not doing inspection. But later, when you get into the phase of um, coding and testing, we can see that the difference here is much higher. So with, with doing inspection, you can get lower cost compared to the inspection. So this study shows that doing inspection can help finding problems early on during this very beginning phase of the software development. And then by having the defects discovered early on, you can reduce the cost in the later stages in the software development. The process at the time was very manual and it's a synchronous process. So um, synchronous means that you have to be meeting together on site. No? So at the time there are no tool, there was no tool to help communicating. So they have to come to meet and um, everybody must be doing this at the same time. And also everything is manual work. So everything must be done manually. So it takes a lot of time, uh, has a very high cost of doing. The process is as follows. So first you do planning first by um, checking the materials that must be inspected, whether it um, conform to the criteria. You might check some of the items, but you might not check some of the items. You check the availability time of the participants and then you arrange the meeting time. Then we move to the second phase, overview. You start letting the participant know what is to be inspected and you assign the roles to the participants. So everybody will become, some of them become reviewers, some of them become the authors, so on and so on. And then Preparation phase is where the participant learn the materials and prepare to, to do their role, okay? And next inspection phase is when you start finding defects. So they focus mostly on finding the defects, but they don't do the suggestion on the solution, uh, alternative solution yet. And then they do rework by having the order fix all the defects, right? So after doing all the fix, the author come back and propose the new fix 
and then it got checked again by the team. So this process is repeated and it keeps going like this. So there can be multiple meetings and uh, a lot of people involved. So we can see that this process of uh, code inspection in the past is quite costly and it takes a lot of time. People start finding a new way to do better code inspection. And nowadays we have this concept called modern code review, okay? So the name has changed from code inspection to code review and the word modern means we add some tools to help us. So the modern code review is opposite to the um, continue us uh, to the code inspection in a way that it is not synchronous, but it's a synchronous activity. It can be done online without coming to meet and it can happen at a different time. Moreover, it is a work that can be done both manual and you have some tools to support you, okay? So by having this modern code review concept, people can review code or other artifacts much faster and they can do it at their own preferred time. So it's more flexible as well. So let's see how the process is like. You have the initial code and then you also still have the set of reviewers who will check those code. So the reviewer check the code and then they give some review feedback on what to be changed. The author make the changes. So they do the fix and then they propose this fixed version to the reviewer again. So this loop keeps going on just like the previous one. And when everybody is happy, that code will be accepted and merged into the main code base, okay? We don't do this manually now. So now we have some tools. For example, GitHub, we'll have GitHub pull requests to help us doing code review, okay? And this is the lab exercise that you're gonna do today. We're gonna use GitHub pull requests to simulate the actual code review uh, that happens in a software team. You can have Garrett code review tool and Fabricator is a code review tool that has been used in Facebook, okay? If you look at the process at Google, um, Google also follow the same process of modern code review that we have seen and adding some, a little bit of uh, addition. So at Google, the user or the author start writing the new code or we call it a patch or a diff. And then they apply automated review comment first by adding some tools to check um, coding style, checking some code syntax, so on and so on, checking some security vulnerabilities. And then if everything is okay, they send that to the reviewers. So the reviewers review the change and then they add comments. That will be sent to the author so the author modify the change and then send back the new version to the reviewers again. So this loop, again, keep going on. And when everybody is okay, when they are happy, the reviewers will mark it as accepted or looks good to me. Okay, so looks good to me is the very uh, popular word that has been used when you do code review. So when you get LGTM or looks good to me, that means your code change is, is good enough and it passes the, the code review process. So the author is the one that commit the change to the code base, okay? There is a study at Microsoft uh, by interviewing 900 software engineers. They found that 39% uh, or almost 40% review other people's code at least once a day. So 40% go to work, they do some other works, but they also need to review other people's code at least once a day. 21% review more, more than one time per day. So these person are even more committed to code review. They review other people changes to, um, multiple times per day. 36% review a couple of times per week. So 
they might not do every single day, but at least in one week, they do it multiple times. And there are 13% that do not do code review in the last week or do it just once per week. So this number tells us that the opposite of 87% do more than uh, one time per week. At least one time or more than one time per week, which is a lot, okay? And the motivations for doing code review are as follows. By following the um, Michael Fagan's concept, the number one motivation for doing code review is to find defects. But nowadays, we also use code review to also find some improvements to apply to the code. Okay. And code improvement has been ranked as number one here, even more than finding the defects. And then we found that code review can also increase the knowledge transfer among the team members. By doing code review, people suggest alternative solution. They suggest the way to fix problem and they might suggest to change uh, the code in some other ways. So when you get your code reviewed by the others, you learn from them. And at the same time, the people who review the code might also learn from the code author as well, how to write code. Um, like if they are senior programmers and the one that reviewed the code is the junior one, they might learn from those senior programmers on how to write a very good code. And the opposite way, the junior programmers might get suggestion when, they, when their code is being reviewed as well. And then the others are finding alternative solutions uh, that are proposed during the, the review activity. This can be used to improve the development process and to avoid breaking builds, which means when you integrate the changes from multiple people, um, you can still compile the, the integrated software. And it builds the team awareness. So your uh, your task is to also check other people's code and other people's implementation. So you don't only know what you are responsible for, but you also know that what other people are working on. So this creates better team awareness that everybody knows what other people are doing. And at the same time, it also creates chair code ownership in a way that um, the, the person who writes the code is not only the owner of that code, because this code has been reviewed by other people, it incorporates other changes that the other people in the team also suggest. So this code now belongs to the whole team instead of just one person. And yeah, when there are any issues, it is the team's code, right? So it's not only pointing fingers that this is your code, you have to fix it. It now becomes everybody's code and it creates better engagement of um, the the responsibility in the team. And it can also be used to assess the productivity of the team, how much code review has been done. And it can even be used to evaluate the, the programmers itself, like how much they contribute to the code review in the past uh, six months or year or so. So the this one is from Microsoft, but this one is from Google and they got similar benefits. So Google say that Benefit of code review is first is to check the correctness of the code. The second one is to ensure that the code is comprehensible to other engineers. So this is about readability, that to make sure that the code is readable by the other people. So sometimes we write code that is very difficult to understand and um, it is difficult to maintain. So this is to ensure that the code that passed the code review will be the one that readable by anyone. And it also ensures consistency across the code base. When multiple people write code, there might be some differences in the way that each people write code. So code review is one of the, the way or mechanic to help create consistency that when people write the code, they should be written in the same way, or at least it should be fixed to be consistent to, to the way that all the people in the team are writing. And it creates team ownership. I already talked about it. It also enables knowledge sharing. I already talked about it as well. 
and it provides the historical records of the code review. So you know when when does people submitted the code, when it got reviewed by who, how much time it takes. So you can use it to evaluate and do assessment of the team or individual in the team. Okay. So when we do code review, um, these are some potential checklists that you should follow. So if you are the reviewer of the code, you should look for the implementation, whether this one do what the code is supposed to do. Okay, does it fulfill the requirements? Does it do the task that the code has to do correctly in a correct way? The second one is that, can this be simplified? Is it too complex? Um, is the solution very difficult to understand? And can you make it simpler? So the, the, the best implementation is the one that still do the task, but as simplest as possible, okay? You don't want to make the implementation to be very complex and only yourself can understand because then it's not very useful for other people and it is difficult to maintain in the long run. And the last one is that we check whether this has any unwanted dependencies or not, okay? So you might include something that doesn't actually be used. So those need to be cleared up. So that is the phase in the code review that check this, whether these um, import statement or the dependency are actually being used. Next is about dependencies. Like when you update the code, <clears throat> do you need to also update other things like documentation, configuration, readme files? Are these related artifacts in your software project need to be updated as well. So code review is also a phase to check um, that everything is up to date. And does it have any problems with other parts of the system? Does it backward, does it have backward compatibility? So the reverse which will make sure that this still can, can support the previous version, let's say of the hardware or other operating system. Like if you update your app, can it be installed on the iOS version 18, 17, 16, so on and so on, okay? The second one is about security and data privacy. So nowadays we have the problem of security vulnerabilities in, in the software. And also we have some laws or rules about data privacy, right? In Thailand, we have PDPA, which ensure that your personal identifiable data is managed correctly and properly. So code review can be used to, to check whether um, it has any security vulnerabilities or not. Is the authorization, like giving permission to people and authentication that identify whether this is the right person is handled correctly in the right way. And the last one is to check whether sensitive data, like the user data, credit card data are securely handled. Are they encrypted? Are they hash? How do you send them over the network? How is it stored in the database? So on and so on. Now, so this is something related to security and data privacy. The next one is logic errors and bugs. So you think of uh, any use cases that the code might not behave as intended. So this is uh, some corner cases that the developers might not think about. Like um, if it doesn't have any connection to the internet, how would the, the software behave? Or if the files or the database that the software rely on is missing, then yeah, how does the software behave as well? And any other external input or events that could also break the code. Like there are some other interruptions, um, hardware run out of memory, run out of hard disk, so on and so on. The next one is about error handling. So does the error is handled correctly? Do you lock what happens? Like, do you have any locking or debugging information that we need to do when there are errors in the source code? And when you have errors, do, they pre do you present the error message to the user in an appropriate way? Or you just dump the whole error message, stack trace, database connections, so on and so on, and present it to the users. Or we have a user-friendly message to tell them that the app has a problem and then 
please restart or something. Okay. The next one is about test ability. So we can check whether the source code is testable, which means is it easy to test? Now we're going to talk about test uh, in, in my next lecture. And also can check whether it have enough automated tests, whether it's going to be unit test, integration test, or system test. The next one is about readability. Uh, we check whether the code is easy to understand and any parts that are confusing and why, and how can it be improved? So this is more about the, the writing and the formatting and the, the way that you um, read the code, okay? The last set of check is to check for usability and accessibility whether this solution is well-designed and it can be usable by multiple type of users. So this is about UX, whether it is good design or not. And also if you provide the API, the code review can check whether the API is also well-documented or not so that other people can use your API easily. Performance is another aspect that code review can help. So the reviewer will check whether this will have any impact on the system performance. Does it improve the performance or does it degrade the performance and in which way? And also, um, can you suggest some improvement on the performance of the code? The last thing is we can have some other expert that in the team doesn't have those specialty or it doesn't have the, any expertise. Like you can have a security expert to review your implementation to make sure that all the code is secure. Or you can have a usability expert that is very good at UX and UI design, and then they can also review your implementation and also provide you feedback on how to improve in those aspects. Okay, so um, this is pretty much it about code review. And next I'm gonna move on to the concept of version control. Okay, so version control is coming to solve the problem of having changes. When we, when we work on software projects or any kind of digital files, we need to handle the changes, right? So for example, if you have a document and the document is being changed, you might need to copy it over and then rename it to be another version. And then there can be some more updates. You have another version and then you try to make it final and then finally it's not final. You have to have final, final, so on and so on. So this, this is a problem that usually occur. And in software development, it's the same. There's, a, there's a one incident in the past that NASA has loaded wrong software version into their rocket, and then the rocket exploded after it launched. So even very um, simple um, tasks like identifying the right version can go very wrong and it has a lot of impacts on terms of uh, cost, time, money, and even people's life, right? So we have this concept called version control system or VCS. So VCS is a part or a component in configuration management in software engineering. So configuration management is how to handle changes in software. Okay, but to track the version of the implementation is just a part of it. And there are other types, like how can you track the version of the documents? How can you make sure that people know that this is the version that they need to work on or is this a reference, so on and so on, okay? But today we're gonna focus only in the aspect of code and implementation. So by having a version control system, we can restore what has already been Done. And um, let's say you can go back to get the older version of the software. So in case any problem occur and you're still figuring out how to fix it, you can retrieve the previous stable version and then uh, deploy it back to the, to the system first. And then you fix the problem and then you move on. Okay, so one of the benefits is that you need to be able to restore the previous configuration. The second one is coordinating change when you work in a team. 
there are many people that work together and everybody is making their own changes. How, how can we coordinate their changes so that we do not override each other? And yeah, there's an easy way to incorporate all the changes together. The last one is to identify the version and the components. So how can we, how can we know how many versions in the software and how can we locate specific, lo uh, very specific version and specific item? So VCS is implemented as a tool and every tool has very similar concept as follow. So you have this time that starts from left to right. So you might have time in the past and then move on another month and then two more months. You have the projects that you are working on. So the project have files that get modified and added over time. And then you have a version control system that tracks all the changes that occur in the project. Okay, so let's start by um, time time slot number one. We have a new file. Let's say this is file a dot pi. So if you configure the VCS to to look at this project, it will record that file a has been created. And then later you add a new file called b.py and you modify something in file A. So the VCS will record it that file B is created and file A got modified. So later, file A, B is modified and then you add a new file C and D. So this will track that A and B is modified and C and D are created. So this step keeps going and then you get the whole history of your software development. So in the past, uh, we started having the first tool called VCS, CVS, sorry. So CVS is a tool that try to fix the problem of version control. It has this repository, which is um, location of a software project. Okay, it contains everything. It contains source code, it contains document. So think about it as a folder that you put everything in. Okay, so repository is something that will be tracked by version control system. And let's say you have two developers that work on this project, Alice and Bob. Alice and Bob will start by check out their own um, files that they want to use. So if a list working on file A, the CVS system will track that and it will lock file A. So Bob cannot work on file A at the same time. This is to prevent uh, overriding problem or um, conflicts that might occur. And if Bob want to work on file B, um, this CVS will create a lock on file B. And then a list cannot work on file B. Whenever Alice finishes um, doing fixing of file A, she check in and then the CVS system will remove the lock. And then um, Bob can now start making changes to file A and then this system will lock again. So this thing keeps going on. Um, it is somewhat as efficient in a way that it keeps track of all the changes and it avoid uh, problems when people collaborating, but it is slow because this locking mechanism creates um wait right. So people need to wait for the artifact to be unlocked first so that they can work on those artifacts. So later, people has invented a new tool called SVN. So SVN uh, continues the concept of CVS, but it adds some new functionality to help. Um, removing those roadblocks. So you still have the repo. And let's say we have Alice and Bob as uh, previously. Both has this partial copy of the history of the code. So they, they retrieve the source code repo and then in their local computer, they have this copy, but not full copy. So whenever um, Alice and Bob work on the same file, that there is no lock here. So they can both work on the same file at the same time. But whenever they commit it back, 
Okay, so comet is um when you want to save the changes to version control system. When when they commit, the version control system will check whether <clears throat> the changes occur at the same location or not. So let's say it has this content, and the green one is what Alice has added, and the yellow one is what Bob has added. So if it's this case, then everything is okay because you don't modify the same location. So all the changes can be easily merged. But let's say if there's a case that Bob and Alice modify the same location on the same file, this will create a conflict and Subversion will ask uh, the person who makes the, the last commit to check this conflict and solve the conflict. So Alice might choose to keep hers and delete the others or might keep Bob's and delete hers or she might keep both and then arrange the code in a way that it, it can be worked together. Okay, so with Subversion, you can fix the problem of um, working together and still having the all the history of the project. The drawbacks of SVN is that the full history is being kept in the server. And when you commit, you need to have a connection to the server. So if you don't have the connection, you cannot make a commit. For example, if you work on an airplane on a flight that doesn't have any network connection, you cannot you cannot make a commit. And if you are working in a company that has the version control system only inside the company's network, you cannot go back home and work on your project and make a commit because you need to have connection to the server. So we have the last one, which is called Git that solve such problems. So Git is considered as distributed repositories and the conflict is more flexible in a way that you have a repository and everybody that work on those repo will have a local copy, which is the full copy of the repo. When he or she does the commit, it will be done locally within those machines. So you don't need to have the connection to the server in order to make a commit. And when, whenever you want to, to sync your changes to other people in the team, you do push and pull, okay? So push is when you push your change, uh, push your changes to the repo and pull is when you pull the changes from the repo. And when people make uh, changes to the same location in the code, it still has the same idea of conflicts as SVN, and then the developer solve the conflict in the same way. So Git is become very popular nowadays. I think most of the software projects nowadays are using Git, and it already outshadow other tools like Subversion and CVS. Because it is easy to learn, it is um, open source, so it's free to use. It has very good performance, it's pretty quick. And it has other features like doing branching that helps managing the software development process better. I'm going to talk about the branching after this. So by having this concept of distributed version control, everything happens locally and everything is fast because it occur um, locally on the machine so that um, everything is committed locally and is fast. And when you use Git repo, Every single clone repository has a full copy of the software project. So that is when you have the backup as well. So even the Git server is not available, you still have the full backup on the programmer's machine. Everything works offline and all the repo, since it's a full backup, you have the full history of everything. So, um, something that is new in Git is that it has this new stage uh, called staging area. Okay, let me explain you by this uh, diagram. So if you have this file called a.py, you add it to the version control system. First, 
Git will not track the file. So the file will have status called untracked. Whenever uh, you decide to start having Git to track the, the file, a.py, you need to call add by running the command add a.py. And then the file will be in the stage area. You can decide to remove it by calling rm a.py. And then the file will be removed and Git won't track the history of this file. But if you decide to commit by using the commit command, the file will be tracked in the version control and the state does now become unmodified. If you make some later changes to the file, like you add these following new changes, the file will be marked as edited. And then uh, it will know that there's a edit and then the file will have the status called modify. And then the process repeat by adding it and then commit it again. So usually this loop will occur. And whenever you, you want to remove it out of the tracking, you, you do removed. But every single history that already been committed will be saved in the repo. So even you remove the file later, but if you go back in the previous version, you can still get the file back anyway. The other things that are added in Git is pool, which is when you download the changes. from other people and push, which is uploading your changes. So push and pull is a way that you can sync with your friends or your team members. Is this very similar to when you put the file in Google Drive, right? You can, uh, you push your file. And then when you get the changes that your friends work on the same project, then you are pulling the changes. With this concept, we kind of have decentralized uh, repository, but you can choose to centralize it at some time. So let's say if Alice, David, Bob, and Claire work together, they can have their own version of the, of the GitHub repo. Okay, they can have different branches, different content, but whenever they push pull, then everything is synced by having this Git server as a centralized um, location. And then everybody can choose when you want to update <clears throat> their changes or they want to get their changes from the others. <clears throat> okay, so the last thing that our uh, good about Git is it provides branch or branches. Branch is a way that you make another copy of your software repo inside the repo. And you can use branch to try some new things to make bug fixes, uh, to add new features without affecting the stable version of your software. And the main default branch in Git is called the master branch. And usually the master branch is the one that you keep your production code, okay? When you have a new things that you want to do, you will create a new branch. So you create a new branch when you want to add a new feature, when you want to have a new release of your software, when you want to try experiment with some new changes, like new technologies that you don't know before, uh, you might try it using create a new branch and you use it to fix a bug. Okay, so how does it work? The main concept is like this. You have the main branch that keeps going on and it be the one, it will be the one that keep your stable version of your software. And then when you want to add a new feature, you create a new branch out of this main branch. And this is for one feature. And then you create another branch for another feature. So you keep doing this. And when everything is done, you merge it back into the main branch. There's a concept called Git workflow that is a best practice when we use Git. So this thing tells us exactly 
how we create branch and for which activities. Okay, so let's see. So at the beginning, we would have two branches. This is the main branch, the order master branch, and then you have the development branch. The main branch, we only keep the main version or the stable versions. And the development branch will be the one that you keep working on. So you can have more commits here. Whatever you are working on, it can be kept in the development branch. So this is the, the main location that the developer will work on. And then if you want to create some specific feature, you have another branch for those specific features. So this is like branch for feature one. This is branch for feature two, uh, feature two. And then this branch come out of the development branch. And whenever it is finished, it merged back into the development branch. This one might be a bigger features. So it might keep going for a while. And then at the end, it will also be merged into the development branch. Okay, so for every feature, you add a new branch for that specific feature. And it can be assigned to specific people as well. So this might be a branch that Alice work on, and this might be branch that Bob is work on. And for the release branch, when you, make, when you want to make some release, you can have a release branch to keep only the version that you want to release. So let's say if you want to release only when it's a full version, like 1.0, 2.0, you, you put that in a release branch. And whenever it has another version, you also have uh, another commit in that branch. While the other, um, the other minor version, you don't put it in the release branch. So the release branch will be the one that keeps only the main releases of your software. And the last one is when you have a bug. So let's say you discover that there's a bug here, you create a new branch called hotfix. And this hotfix branch will fix the bug. And then when you finish, you merge it back to both uh, main branch and also the development branch. And that the, the later changes after this will also contain that fix, right? So this is uh, for fixing uh, the problem. So to summarize, in GitFlow, you start by creating a development branch from the main branch. And you also create a release branch from the development branch. When you want a new feature, you create a new feature branch from the development branch. When the feature is complete, you merge it back into the development branch. When also when the release branch is done, you also merge it back into the development and the main branch. If you find any issue, you create a hotfix branch. And then when the hotfix is complete, you merge it back to both development and the main branch. Okay, so this Git workflow is something that people have been following and using for a long time. I think many people uh, in the companies are still using this Git flow workflow. But nowadays in the new era that you have DevOps, and the new way of development, we also have the new concept called trunk-based development. So for trunk-based development, it is, a com it is a common practice for DevOps team. So if you are developing the software and you have the DevOps team, they might prefer to have a trunk-based development, which is uh, you develop and you create a very small branch. It, it is very short-lived and you only work on one small thing and then you merge back. So if we compare uh, Git workflow and the trunk-based development, you would get this uh, figure that for the Git flow workflow, you have a lot of branch and some of the branches are long leaf, like the main one, the develop one, the release one. In the trunk-based development, it's the opposite. You have very short leaf one. So you have one for some small things and then you have another branch for a feature and you only keep everything in the main branch or the master branch. You don't add too many branches. This is easier in a way of management because you have just one main branch that people will keep updating it. 
and you don't need to manage a lot of branching here. So there are pros and cons, and um, it depends on the team which of the methods that they want to use. Okay, um, so these are the concept of code review and version control. And I think you have enough knowledge to start working in the lab exercise after lunch now. And yeah, sorry, since I have to go soon. So the content of code comments and implementation concepts, I will create a recorded video and then I'll send to you uh, very, very soon today. Okay. Um, any questions for now? Okay. If not, I hope you enjoy the lab exercise. And then um, if you have any question, you can ask me in the chat. Okay. And the next lecture, I'll be on site and talking about uh, testing. Okay. That will be all for today's live lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, so we are going to have okay. the class with you um next next week, right? Um on the 13th. Yeah. But next week we are going we are still have the class with me, okay? <laughs> See <laughs> then. Okay. See you. Okay. So I need to leave now, Ajahn Tam. So thank you, Kap. Thank you, Kap. Kap. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.